Hi, I'm Mike Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is this new anti-Semitism. It's a phenomenon which needs to be better understood and analyzed. The new breed of Democratic women elected to serve in Congress, almost all of them have a problem in common. They don't understand English. Not that they don't understand the individual words, they don't understand the concepts or nuance. And their own lexicons in elementary are sparse. Now, their knowledge of history is sorely lacking. And their young age is no excuse for this. They don't realize that some things should not be said, that some thoughts should not be given voice, especially in public. Maybe they just don't care. Ilhan Omar's repeated and openly stated disbelief that what she said about split loyalty was anti-Semitic is a prime example. Omar did not understand the meaning behind her comments. It wasn't simply that what she said was insulting. She knew it would be insulting and hurtful. It was she didn't know that it was important. Omar did not know that with her statement, she was invoking an ages-old anti-Semitic canard, challenging Jews and their loyalty. A canard is a hoax, an unfounded story suggesting that Jews were lobbying for a foreign country and not realizing that the actual lobby, APAC, fought for the best interests of the United States is ignorant and myopic. APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, and other organizations, including non-Jewish organizations and PACs, which support Israel, do so to protect not only Israel, but also to protect the interests of the United States in the Middle East and around the world. A strong relationship with Israel makes for a stronger Israel and a stronger America. Seasoned politicians know that. In the past, newbie political figures have watched, listened, researched, and learned it too. The fact that Omar is sympathetic to the Palestinian cause does not negate the point at all. The fact still stands that Israel is the only democracy in the region. That alone is reason enough to support Israel regardless of any other issue. Deal with those issues separately. Almost everything Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has said makes this point even stronger. Her comments brim over with imprecision. Her proposed policies lack analysis and detail. Whatever she's thinking, she blurts out. Much like her colleague Rashida Talib, a newbie Democratic congresswoman from Michigan, who shouted, we're going to impeach the mother, bop, 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 referring to the President of the United States. Words have meaning far beyond the speaker who thinks what they mean. Sometimes misspeaks are the foundation of great humor. And there's a long history of misspeaks, which are so funny that they have become part of our conversational lore. For instance, they're funny because the audience knows the true meaning of the terms, while the speaker is totally oblivious. One example is what we call malaprops. The term dates back to the 1775 and received its name from Mrs. Malaprop, a comical character in a play called Rival, written by Richard Brinsley Sheridan. Mrs. Malaprop constantly mispronounced and misused words. She said, for example, he is the very pineapple of politeness, instead of very pinnacle of politeness. Fast forward to the 19th century, and the birth of Spoonerisms emerge. Spoonerisms are named after Reverend William Archibald Spooner, a respected Oxford Don, who had the habit of rearranging the letters in different words in the same sentence. Some Spoonerisms like, it is kistamary to cuss the bride, have become legendary. The issues we're dealing with today, however, are not at all humorous. They are hateful. And it is beneath the office of Congress to speak in the fashion we, as a country, are now assaulted with. Leaders have responsibilities. It comes with the position. They must lead by example, and speech is just one example. That's why the Ethics Committee in Congress has such an important role. Censuring a congresswoman is a very serious issue and can and should have a huge impact on the person's electoral future. What these women have of Congress are saying and proposing certainly has an impact on our future as citizens of the United States. It's nice that Congress passes a resolution against hate, but what a sad state of affairs that the people we elected needed to be legislated not to hate. I'm also thinking about ISIS, uh, the status of ISIS today. ISIS, we in the Western world are being told, 
is defeated, or just about, nearly defeated, almost defeated, while ISIS themselves have not received the memo. They struck yet again in Egypt. This time, the attack was perpetrated in the northern part of the Sinai Desert, an area where ISIS reigns and is undeniably totally free to do as they wish, and ISIS wishes to terrorize. Christians are their target. They're high on ISIS's list. ISIS targets Christians, they kidnap Christians, they attack Christian churches. In this latest attack, a group of ISIS operatives kidnapped an adult male Christian. They attacked as he traveled in a share ride taxi. Police were on the site in seconds and set chase after the terrorists. One terrorist was killed and three wounded. Two police were also wounded in the crossfire. The victim, however, is still believed to be in the hands of the ISIS terrorists. The West has always misunderstood ISIS. Westerners are convinced that the primary target of ISIS is Westerners, particularly Americans. ISIS is certainly anti-West and anti-American and anti-Israel. But more than all of that put together, ISIS is anti-Christian and anti-non-believers. For ISIS, killing a Christian is the primary objective. There is no need to take my word alone on this. ISIS leadership proclaims that agenda to their adherents almost every day. Part one of that agenda is killing non-believers. Part two is to do it not just in the Middle East, but wherever ISIS, where the ISIS is headquartered, but right at home. In other words, in your own backyard, in our backyard. Time and time again, spokesmen from ISIS call on adherents to strike at the infidel in the heartland, not in Syria or Iraq, but in the Western world. For the past several years, ISIS recruited, and their recruiters have been telling their recruits that they are not needed in Iraq and Syria anymore, telling them that their actions will be more worthy and significant when they attack infidels in their own lands. Here are quotes from an ISIS spokesman, part of a 42-minute audio post that just was posted. The post is online and available to all, for all to hear. No secret password needed. Speaking to Muslims, he says, and this is the quote, if you can kill a disbelieving American or European, especially the spiteful and filthy French, or an Australian or a Canadian, or any other disbeliever, then rely upon Allah and kill him in any manner or way, however it may be, unquote. He continues, now speaking to the West, quote, you will not be safe, even in your own bedrooms while you sleep. Your crusader campaign will fail. You will pay the price, and we will hit you on your home front in a way that will cripple you to never extend your long arm ever again, unquote. There is even an ISIS propaganda image sent around the world through ISIS media depicting an ISIS fighter waving a flag while preaching on top of a European church. The caption reads, and here's the quote, Truly we will fight you even in your churches until we raise there the name of Allah is the only God. Unquote. There are several important lessons that we should take away from this latest attack in Egypt. The most important is that ISIS is still alive and kicking. The next critical lesson is that for as long as a single ISIS member is alive, ISIS will claim victory and continue to attack. The ISIS attitude towards victory and defeat defies our Western sensibilities. ISIS has a unique strategy when it comes to winning and losing. If you are still alive, you are winning. It's, the, it's that elementary. According to Western strategy, declaring victory and accepting loss is an integral component. It minimizes cost and damages and avoids further human loss. This is not part of a calculus in the ISIS strategy. Westerners believe in waving the white flag. ISIS enjoys waving around dead bodies. Since they first emerged on the terrorist landscape, ISIS has proclaimed their intention to attack churches and infidels. To date, they have succeeded successfully in murdering thousands of Christians living within ISIS-controlled territories. So brutal were the murders of these Christians that most internet news sites never showed viewers the images. There are pictures of slaughtered Christian children, pictures of heads of children at the top poles in a park in Mosul. The murderers are not limited to Iraq, Syria, and Egypt. They are pervasive. Egypt's Christians are a minority living in the Muslim majority. Coptic Christians, specifically, are a very successful minority there. An entire community, the Christian community in the Middle East, is under attack, and the world has remained relatively silent. There's been no significant religious outcry, political redress or diplomatic pressure to stop these attacks. 
there's been almost no media coverage as, over the past decade, ISIS systematically sets about massacring Christians. The Western world must see ISIS for what it truly is and unite to destroy the threat and save the Christians of the Middle East. And of course, I'm thinking about Iran. With each passing day, Iran moves closer and closer towards a satellite launch. Finally, tests, uh, final tests for three separate satellites were recently completed in Iran. The satellites are now cleared for takeoff and may be launched at any time. Satellites. Iranian leadership has said that they will be sending their two of their satellites into space imminently. The announcement came during a memorial program for the late President Akbar Hashami Rafsanjani, the fourth elected president of Iran, and one of the men instrumental in placing Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, the supreme leader, in his position. Iran's current president, Hassan Rouhani, proudly proclaimed, and here's his quote, soon in the coming weeks, we will send two satellites into space using our domestically made rockets. Two of Iran's satellites are imaging satellites. That means spy satellites. The third is a telecommunication satellite. Sometimes countries like Iran try to deceive the world and categorize these spy satellites as weather satellites. Iran has no need to go that route. That is the point in the game. Okay, it's international rhetoric. Iran is being blunt and open. They're launching imaging satellites, satellites that take pictures as they circle the Earth. The telecom satellite is used for phones and the Internet. It's just as crucial as Iran's quest for world domination as are imaging satellites. Iran wants to remain as independent as possible and needs to be able to protect their own telecom systems against hacking and spying while at the same time use cutting edge technology to hack and spy on the technology of other countries. It's common practice for countries to name their satellites. Sometimes the names are significant, sometimes they're playful. One of the Iranian satellites, the imaging satellites, is named Dusti, which means friendship in Farsi, the Persian language. The second name given is Payam, which means message. The third satellite, its name is called Nahid One. Farsi, Nahid, translates to mean stars or a collection of stars. Actually, sometimes it actually refers to Venus also. Iran has been advancing quickly in space technology. In 2013, they launched a monkey into space. The plan is to build a satellite technology that will culminate in a satellite system called PARS Satellite System. The Iranians hope to have that system completed by 2024. That's only five years away. These satellites will stay in orbit for three years. With that decision, Iran is taking their technology to a new and greater level. Until now, dating back to the past 10 years, Iranian satellites only stayed in orbit for short periods of time, a few months even. These are longer-lasting space trips, more in the image of Russia's adventures into space. The United States is pressuring Iran to put the brakes on. During a press conference he held in Jordan, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo made it clear that Iran needs to be contained when he said, quote, you'll see in the coming days and weeks we are, we're redoubling not only our diplomatic but our commercial efforts to put pressure on Iran to achieve what it is we set out for them back in May. The president's decision to withdraw our folks from Syria in no way impacts our capacity to deliver on that, unquote. The inherent dangers of satellite imagery and telecom satellites are obvious. At long last, the United States and other Western leadership realize that the same rockets that are used for space technology are used to deliver non-conventional weapons, specifically chemical, biological, and nuclear warheads. We may not understand their language or share their dress code, but Iran is by no means a backward, backwater, uneducated society. Iranians are enormously well-educated, highly cultured, admire music, learning, poetry, art, philosophy. They are significant contributors to world culture. One field in which Iranians excel is the world of science. Do not underestimate Iran. Iranian leadership is smart and savvy and science-minded. Coming up next, points of view. First up is a column from the New York Post, and it too deals with anti-Semitism, but in a very different way. The author of this column is Joel Gray, the Tony and Academy Award-winning star of Cabaret and the director of Fiddler on the Roof in Yiddish. 
It is entitled, In an Age of Surging Antisemitism, We Need to Bring Back Yiddish, and was published on February 23, 2019. This is how he begins. As a son of Mickey Katz, the great comedian and klezmer clarinetist, I grew up with a somewhat complicated relationship to Yiddish. It was, for our family, both a joy and a problem. My dad was struggling to support our family of four when he had an idea to create a comedy record, a popular American classic, but with Yiddish lyrics, so that Home on the Range became Haim Afimranje. Then came Borscht Riders in the Sky. How much is that pickle in the window? And his biggest hit, Dovid Crockett. Dad suddenly had, was a household name, especially amongst Jewish households. But the backlash was swift. Though anti-Semitism was rampant and fierce, it wasn't the anti-Semites who ultimately forced some radio stations across the country to stop playing his records. There was a concern among some Jews that maybe his comedy was reinforcing the same kind of stereotypes here in the United States that dogged Jews across Europe for generations. Mr. Gray now describes how the play was cathartic for people, his play, was cathartic for people who saw it because of the uptick of anti-Semitism. The Yiddish, he writes, was helpful. Quote, shortly after the opening number, it became clear by the reaction of the audience, widely diverse in age, race, and one would imagine religion, that every moment of the show had taken on a heightened reality in the shadow of the day's news. This 54-year-old cultural touchstone perhaps the most beloved in Broadway history, found itself in a direct and urgent dialogue with grief-stricken 21st century America. How utterly surprising, at least, to Mickey Katz's boy, that this dialogue could be taking place in our long, languishing language of the ghetto. I don't speak Yiddish, neither do most of our casts or audience members, but true humanity knows no language barrier. Well said. Next up is a column by John Pathoritz, published on January 31st, 2019, and it appeared in dozens of papers. I took this from the New York Post. Pathoritz is one of the clearest thinkers in today's huge stable of columnists. This piece is entitled, Can Moderate Dems Stem Anti-Israel Tide? And online, it was called, The Left Would Be Wise to Worry About Its Anti-Semitic Wing. Both titles are exceptional in the way they convey the ideas. Here is how Padhoritz begins. Jewish conservatives get asked this question more than any other. Why are Jews liberals? The question eventually got so tiresome that my father, himself a prominent Jewish conservative, wrote an entire book about tracing the history back to biblical times. You can still buy it on Amazon. So I'm not going to answer it here. He now gives the reader some details. What we know is this basic fact. In national elections, Jews vote for Democratic candidates by a margin of three to one. That number has been fairly consistent for four elections now. It suggests Democrats should have no concerns about keeping Jews in their coalition for another generation. And yet, they do have such concerns. They should. Given some perspective, Pathoritz tries to explain why. This week, prominent Democrats announced a new group called Democratic Majority for Israel led by the pollster Mark Melman. He told the New York Times, most Democrats are strongly pro-Israel and we want to keep it that way. There are a few discordant voices, but we want to make sure that what's a very small problem doesn't metastasize into a bigger problem. The very small problem Melman has in mind is a trio of newly elected Democrats, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Mishkin's Rashida Tlaib, and Minnesota's Ilhan Omar. They seem to have very few foreign policy views, aside from a caricature of Israel as an occupying colonial force that sits up at night thinking of new ways to torment Palestinians. So far, Pathoritz is 100% correct. Now he explains how, in 2016, presidential hopeful Bernie Sanders opened the door to this anti-Israel stance. Pathoritz writes, Bernie Sanders came very close to espousing anti-Zionist opinions openly in 2016, and he won 22 states. His path was softened by the hostile posture of President Barack Obama's administration. Obama claimed to be a friend of Israel, but there was no country or government he criticized more over his eight years, and he concluded his term allowing a UN resolution hostile to the Jewish state 
to pass without an American veto. Now Pothard con concludes, what should be concerning is the subject that goes unaddressed in Melman's fight, the potential mainstreaming of anti-Semitism in the Democratic Party as represented by the renewed public importance of Louis Farrakhan and the refusal of the vanguard figures on the left, like the leaders of the Women's March, to repudiate his noxious filth. Here, too, Democrats need not worry today, but this electorally or when it comes to votes and donations. Instinctively liberal, Jews are bound to be more alarmed by some of the white nationalist encroachments into President Trump's GOP. But the Corbyn example looms large and is arguably far more dangerous to the American Jewish future than anti-Israel sentiment in the Democratic Party is to Israel's future. Coming up, commentary through cartoons where pictures tell the story. This first cartoon is from the China Daily and it's drawn by Louis. I kid you not, Louis. <laughs> now, uh, it's titled The Middle East Maze. A globe is stuck in the maze trying to find the door for peace. There are all these doors and passageways that lead nowhere. Peace is nowhere to be found. It is simply a thought in his head. Next up is a cartoon entitled Islamic Re Revolution Iran. The artist's name is Schott from the Netherlands. Iran is celebrating the 40th anniversary of the Islamic Revolution. The Ayatollah is on stage flanked by two women. One is holding a sign, Death to America. The second is holding a sign, Death to Israel. Party decorations are strung between two gallows with nooses. Below the cartoon, the caption reads, Festive celebration of 40 years Iranian revolution. In a moment, more of my own perspective and a few predictions. This is the kind of story that makes those who read it laugh. Unfortunately, stories like this one are totally undercovered. Iceland's Eurovision entry, which is scheduled to compete in Tel Aviv this year, has challenged Israeli Prime Minister to Glima. Glima is a test of strategy and physical strength. Strategy wins hands down in the national sport of Iceland, Glima. The Icelandic group chosen to represent Iceland in Eurovision is a techno band called Hatari. They originally said they would not attend, but now they are performing and they are challenging Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu to Glima. The band called Hatari defines themselves as an anti-capitalist techno performance art group. Now they, they published an invitation to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to Glima, a Nordic folk wrestling match. This is a major step in the right direction. Who cares who wins? Oh, there will never be an actual Glima. But there is an opening to talk. Former Pakistani President Pervez Musharraf announced in late February that Pakistan should consider establishing ties with Israel. This is his quote. There is no harm to establish a relationship with Israel. Musharraf said that and adding, it will help Pakistan counter India by assessing the elite club of influential nations. There have been previous talks between Israel and Pakistan. In 2005, businessman Jack Rosen facilitated a meeting between the two countries' foreign ministers. So the idea is not new, but it is interesting. Musharraf made the announcement in Qatar. He is living in Qatar now in self-imposed exile because Musharraf fears that a kangaroo court at home in Pakistan, he has made Qatar his home because he might be brought to trial at home. Iran has prohibited walking dogs in public. Dogs are considered to be evil in Iran. And according to the Iranians, the fact that the West embraces dogs is a sign of their backward nature. Hussein Rahimi, Tehran's chief of police, said, certain people who bring their dogs to public places cause panic and anxiety among the people. He added that local police have obtained permission from the judiciary to confront dog owners who walk their pets in public. People who walk their dogs, he said, in public places shall be dealt with severely, unquote. Dogs will also be banned from cars. Rahimi says, underlying that police will seriously confront dog owners who let their dogs ride in their cars. Iran wants to discourage all dog ownership. In 2010, a senior Iranian religious leader issued a fatwa, a religious ruling, that dogs were unclean and not to be kept as pets. Friendships with dogs is a blind imitation of the West. 
the Grand Ayatollah Nasser Makarem Shirazi said, there are lots of people in the West who love their dogs more than their wives and children. Despite it all, especially among Tehran's middle class, dog lovers persist and they continue to own pets. King Abdullah of Jordan came to Washington, D.C. In the residence of the Jordanian ambassador to the United States, the king met privately with U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Also participating in the meeting was Special Envoy to the Middle East, Jason Greenblatt. And of course, President Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, was there. The meeting was significant. The sheer presence of all the powerful men tasked with making decisions and advising the president on the Middle East and the potential peace plans for the region were gathered in the same room. These are the architects of the plan of the century, the plan that President Trump has promised to deliver. Jordan's support for the plan, whatever it is, is essential. The King of Jordan's support will be used as a tool to convince Palestinian leadership and the Palestinian people to accept the Trump deal. But don't think it was all a one-way street. They talked about the plan, but odds are they also devoted time and energy to talking about what and how much Jordan is asking in order to support the Trump plan. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. Did you know that Yiddish is a language which is based on medieval German? It's written with Hebrew letters. Yiddish varies and varied depending on the region, even on the city. Many local words from host language made their way into Yiddish. The Yiddish of Galicia, Galicia, southern Poland, is very different from the Yiddish of Lithuania. The accent is different. The pronunciation of words is different, very different. The classic example is kugel versus kigel. In Lithuanian, they say kigel. In Poland, they say kugel. There are other places that had Jewish languages too. Ladino, for example, combined medieval Castilian Spanish with Hebrew letters. Maimonides, one of the greatest of all writers, wrote this spectacular commentary on the Mishnah, the Perusha Mishnah, in Judeo-Arabic. That is Arabic using Hebrew letters. Actually, I learned classical Arabic in order to properly learn Maimonides in the original language, relying not on the translation, but on his words themselves. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Mike Alpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.